Hello, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here at the Aptos um, seminar again, and it's uh, wonderful to know with the speakers uh, ahead. We were very privileged to have um, in, in our presence this evening, and I'm proud to be um, able to co-host the meeting. Um, and thank you for the invitation. And I'd like to hand over to Carol, who is going to be in, uh, introducing the first speaker. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to joins, uh, the Joint Asia Pacific Ocular Imaging Society and Asia Pacific Tele Ophthalmology Society webinar. So it's um, very great to see everyone today. So today our theme is how AI transforms uh, clinical practice. So uh, the uh, our um, uh, and co chair, uh, Professor uh, Angus Turner from uh, uh, Alliance Eye Institute in Australia. So uh, welcome everyone. So uh, first I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Gavin Tan. So um, Gavin is a council member of uh, Asia Pacific Tele Ophthalmology Society. He's a senior consultant at the Retina Center in Singapore National Eye Center. And he is the clinical director of the SNEC Ocular Reading Center, which is one of the major imaging reading centers for DR and retina clinical trials in Singapore. So uh, today he is going to give a talk on the home monitoring and telemedicine. So uh, Gavin, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Carol. Um, so let me just get my screen up. Okay, great. So today I'm going to talk about telemedicine and home monitoring and our experience with the uh, new models of care in ophthalmology. So telemedicine is not a new concept. It's something that's been around for a while. And essentially, it's provision of healthcare remotely by various means of telecommunication whether it used to be telephones, now we have smartphones, mobile devices, they can be wireless, we've got video conferencing. And the purpose obviously is to improve the availability of expertise, to improve the access to care and improve the efficiency of our healthcare systems. The most basic and probably the most common type of uh, teleophthalmology that's practiced in many countries and many places all over the world is diabetic retinopathy screening. It's a great <clears throat> clinical use case to de deliver telemedicine in our experience in Singapore, we have a national screening program, which like many others uses um, image capture sites in a primary care, remote transmission to a reading center, non-physician graders that re read these images and a report is sent back to clinicians that advises them on the severity of disease and the kind of management, whether it be referral urgency or continuing screening that needs to be taken. <clears throat> And of course, uh, teleophthalmology for DR screening is also a great use case to discuss about how the synergy between having teleophthalmology and, art and developing artificial intelligence really works together because you, you, there is a clearly defined public health gap. There's a single modality, easy to develop um, IT infrastructure. You need a diagnosis without too much clinical data. There are lots of robust outcome and cost effectiveness studies and a lot of the impact of change don't necessarily um, affects the specialist provider. And that allows an incremental, not so much a disruptive uh, additive change when you develop an artificial intelligence to address this problem. I'm not gonna go so deep into detail into AI because our next esteemed speaker will be talking about it in detail. Let's go back to teleophthalmology as a use case. So how do you take teleophthalmology out of that screening process? So that's the simple thing everybody does and then take it to a, a kind of a wider application. <clears throat> Let's take a quick look at what happens in our traditional clinic process. Essentially, most of our ophthalmology clinics runs in stages. We tend to do some um, vision evaluation, uh, be evaluating the visual acuity, getting some history, physical examination. We may add imaging to that as part of clinical consult or do imaging after a clinical consult. Then with all that data available, we will be able to then interpret the data, make a decision, and then effect care, whether it's management or patient communication. So in teleophthalmology, you got to think about how we're going to replace that physical face-to-face -face process with the various tools and devices that we increasingly have available to them. And I, I really feel we look at, need to look at how we're going to get information on symptoms, how we're going to replace the physical examination, 
how we're going to deal with interpretation of that data, and then lastly, of course, to effect management. And one of the key enablers in, in this whole process is the wide availability as of um, newer, better imaging devices that allows us to image, um, in my case, I have a retinal bias, unfortunately, but image the eye in the kind of extreme detail that was not available maybe 20 or 30 years ago when we used to still take up these uh, manual slides of, of the funders. So integrating this whole experience, what we eventually want to do is to convert that patient, the traditional patient journey into something where you use digital solutions to address either a, a gap of communication, uh, avoiding patient travel, speeding up the time of turnover in order to, to address a few things. Firstly, long waits that we have, crowding in our hospital, the complicated uh, multiple healthcare personnel involved, and sometimes it can also help us address unnecessary referrals. <clears throat> and internal ophthalmology really is a wide range of models available for you to apply to your clinic. There are some <clears throat> high intensity things like a video consultation that allows two-way communication. But in ophthalmology, the major limiting factor is that um, unlike perhaps dermatology, where you can speak to the patient, get the patient to show his hand skin lesion on a camera, the traditional video consultation doesn't allow you to examine the eye. So people have had virtual or imaging clinic models where they develop um, assets or deliver assets in the community where certain ocular investigations can be done in the community and these ocular investigations can then be interpreted asynchronously at a specialist care hospital and an outcome can be sent back to, to the patient or this can be coupled with video consultation to provide two-way communication. And of course, the last real key in this whole process is how do we enable patients to take better care of themselves and that involves some form of home monitoring. And of course, we've always had the handy AMSA chart for patients to do home monitoring, but really, a flimsy piece of paper that a patient easily loses, uh, gets dirty or forgets about altogether is not the ideal tool if you want to be serious about um, doing home monitoring and replacing some of our face-to-face -face interaction with a home monitoring device. <clears throat> I think for a lot of people, COVID has been a, the big instigator for change. Um, it was in our setting as well. We were looking at various imaging clinics for a while, but COVID really allowed us to scale and expand these small little pilot projects. So what we've done in terms of a, a retina clinic, for example, is in patients with very active disease, for example, your intravitreal injection patients, you still can't avoid a clinic visit because you physically need to be within literally touching distance of a patient to develop the, deliver an intravitreal injection. Uh, but we do know the large majority of our patients are stable or relatively less active retinal diseases. And these can, in theory, have remote imaging, uh, history, a kind of symptom taking done by a technician. And it can be asynchronously reviewed at distance by a physician who then later makes further decisions. If the patient doesn't need anything further done, great, you can give him an outcome, tell him to arrange a, a follow-up appointment in a certain period of time. Whereas if they need intervention, only then do they need to travel and make that distance back to the treatment clinic where face-to-face -face interaction and intervention can be applied. And our example of this experience was the delivery of a multimodal imaging telemedicine clinic where we identified patients which we felt did not have very active disease or were less likely to need active intervention at every visit. So in this case, these patients then had underwent a different kind of clinical interaction protocol where they had a technician or nurse taking visual acuity, history taking, performing dilation and imaging. We had again a non-physician grader interpreting these images that allow us to make a snap decision. Does anything need to be done urgently or not? If nothing urgently needed to be done, the patients went along their way and a full review was done asynchronously by an ophthalmologist later, which then gave the patient a full report or modified the end disposition outcome and if necessary, brought the patients back to this clinic. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, teleophthalmology tends to be a, a great platform to develop AI. And once you have lots of imaging data with good, well-defined uh, phenotyped out outcomes, then you can use this data to train an artificial intelligence that will eventually replace some of that human function in these imaging loops. 
So we did want to compare how imaging alone in a remote site in the community did compared with traditional slit lamp examination, face-to-face -face examination with whatever uh, imaging that the clinician wanted to order per se. What we did find is a standard protocol of an ultra wide field image with an OCT uh, compared with a physician seeing at a slit lamp, then making specific image related decisions, uh, basically had pretty similar end outcomes um, in terms of cases that need some form of urgent intervention. And these were mostly proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Um, there was great agreement between both the clinician at a slit lamp and the clinician in reviewing only the multi modal imaging. And in fact, when we did it, this was a blinded study. We found that there were, um, of our 400 patients, there were two cases of proliferative diabetic retinopathy that the clinician missed on a slit lamp or a BIO examination that was identified on the ultra wide field. And that could have changed examination and perhaps changed the end visual outcome for these patients. We also tried to evaluate the difference between uh, what if we tried to replace non-physician graders in this loop and compare this to specialists and here the outcome was the detection of any retinal disease, which we defined in this cohort as the presence of either severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, active PDR, center involving diabetic macular edema, or active neovascular AMD. And the reference standard here was a retinal specialist who had done a slit lamp examination and had both the ultra wide field and the OCT available to make a decision. And this was compared with our non-physician graders who made a, a active, non-active decision based on only UWF and OCT. Of these 500 patients, uh, roughly 500 patients in the cohort, 38, about 8% had active retinal disease. And our graders act, performed reasonably well, showing uh, sensitivity and specificity quite similar to our gold standard. Uh, the positive predictive value was uh, about 76%, so there were a few false positives, but the negative predictive value was pretty good. And the only two cases of active retinal disease they missed were severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which in most places would even then not um, receive immediate intervention. <clears throat> in this experience, we also found these virtual kind of imaging clinics compared to a traditional face-to-face -face specialist clinics took a much less turnover time for the patients and overall patient satisfaction was very, very good. We've also applied such similar teleophthalmology clinic concepts to glaucoma, where the glaucoma patient can have a uh, <clears throat> Humphrey visual field and some uh, disc imaging, whether it's just a photograph or in some certain circumstances, a nerve fiber layer OCT done in the community. And the ophthalmologist can then review all this data, decide on, on management decisions, and if manage, no management changes are required, patient can be a form, medications can be mailed to the patients. Whereas if there's a change of management and active communication required, we could pair this with video consultation. Some early patient satisfaction outcomes and time outcomes in the early pilot of our glaucoma clinic found patient satisfaction to be above 90%. Very few patients actually needed a, a return visit to the specialist clinic for various reasons. Patients spend a lot of time, much less time in their whole journey. And of course, the specialist time required to conclude an interaction overall was much less. So instead of seeing 20 patients in an afternoon, the specialist was able to go through about three times as many patients' uh, um, encounters within the same kind of period, which increased their productivity. And in actual fact, that resulted in a decrease in the per capita manpower cost of providing glaucoma care with this model. So what else can you do to, ch to change the whole traditional patient journey that we get patients to do? And we think that home monitoring and certain amount of self-checking or mobile app actuated evaluations can be done prior to the clinic visit. Uh, just as a simple example, we are piloting a visual acuity self-check, which can also collect information such as history, symptomology, past medical history, and if everything checks out, we may even be able to perform, give the patients dilating drops to, keep, to apply for themselves before their, their follow-up visit, their actual clinic visit. And at the same time, after a visit, uh, delivering home monitoring can change the whole care process as well. Just looking at our vision check uh, app, uh, experience, we initially wanted to just use the available tools on the market. But what we found 
was that there were, there were still limitations in terms of calibration, in terms of ensuring patients were compliant with certain measures. So we have developed an app that does a few things. It is able to ensure patient is holding the phone at a standardized distance, ensure that they are covering an appropriate eye, and it's able to detect any changes in positioning, eye opening that may affect the results. Of course, this is never foolproof without patient co co cooperation. However, we felt that it was able to give us a, a, an equivalent visual acuity result that had a better confidence interval compared to the existing uh, products available. And we're still working towards integrating these app outcomes that allows patients to do their own monitoring and allow seamless integration with our electronic medical records. Another thing that we've tried to do during COVID is, is change the way we really take care of our retinal patients. And in a way, this was not voluntary, it was by force. Um, I don't know how many of the other people in the audience and our panel experienced lockdowns, but we had a lockdown in Singapore as well sometime last year. And during this period, we were not allowed to see our normal stable patients or patients outside of very severe kind of emergency criteria. So in order to, to enable these patients uh, better disease detection and access to our clinic, we provided our, all our retinal patients the option of using a home monitoring application. And in this pilot period, we had 2,200 patients during our COVID lockdown where it was offered a home monitoring app. And again, with a, with a lot of new technology, you're not going to get 100% adoption at the outgo but we felt that the 30% sign-up rate was pretty decent overall. It was for a variety of diseases. And this app um, gets the patient uh, to perform a simple task that measures or estimates the, the current uh, veneer hyperacuity of the patient. And it, it does a few examinations to give it a baseline. And what it looks for is not a visual acuity, but a change or deterioration of the veneer acuity in the patient. And if, it, if it, there was a change in signal that was determined to be clinically significant, then a trigger was then a signal, which provided both the patient as well as us, the provider, information that this patient may potentially have recurrence of some form of macular disease. When we reviewed our whole monitoring triggers of these 700 participants over the six months of the study, 33 patients had triggers, seven were deemed significant and were reviewed early in the clinic, and five of these were found to have disease progression. So we do know these apps can have utility when you're forced to extend vis patient visits because of unforeseen circumstances, but more data really needs to be, or more evaluation needs to be done in order to determine whether these apps really can replace a face-to-face -face or an imaging visit that allows us to monitor patients, or whether it can really then become a trigger for personalized uh, interval for intravitreal treatment, where you rely on a patient's um, self-detected self signal to determine the time they come back to the clinic instead of using arbitrary PRN or treat and extend resumes. So by integrating these various te technologies in the clinic, we feel that in the longer run, you can really improve the efficiency of the way you manage patients, lower costs. Um, in a pandemic, obviously av avoid the risk of COVID transmission, and at the same time, provide enough patient satisfaction that they feel they're not being uh, delivered a lower standard of care. Of course, for home monitoring, there are a multitude of other options available for both patients and physicians. And I think this is one area where there's, a lot, there's going to be a lot of future development of tools um, that, will, that when evaluated in the correct manner, will enable us to deploy these tools to gen gradually change the way we manage patients away from a high burden of face-to-face -face imaging or physician-patient interactions. So in conclusion, um, we can see there's a plethora of new digital technology that's available that will transform our eye care. Um, Teleophthalmology, telemedicine really has had success in diabetic retinopathy screening and with the availability of multimodal imaging, widespread internet connectivity, teleconferencing tools, uh, these tools and platforms will enable us to replace more and more of the physical clinic visit with um, telemedicine physician-patient interactions. And this will result in savings of cost, time, 
with equivalent outcomes and good patient satisfaction. And lastly, the, the advent of mobile devices, home monitoring devices, and in future, we didn't cover that here, kind of portable home imaging devices. These will really revolutionize home-based care for ophthalmology patients. And again, of course, this COVID um, new normal that we're experiencing, we know this pandemic's not going to be ending. I've been fortunate to have my vaccination, but and with 6 billion, 7 billion people around the world, it's really going to be a couple of years before we see an end to it. It really presents with us with new, optimal, new opportunities and impetus to adopt new technologies that reduce uh, the realized, re reliance on patient travel and interaction. And with that, I thank all the people in our various institutions that have contributed to all the data available in my talk. And one day when this is over, please do come and visit us in Singapore. Thank you very much. Well, that was a wonderful talk. Thanks, Gavin. And um, great to see the pilot projects being catapulted into the mainstream and really having a, a value in place right there in Singapore. Um, and I, I think at this um, point, um, we're going to move on, as you say, to that fantastic example of diabetic screening and hear from Dr. Michael Abramov, and then we'll have a chance for panelists to discuss the two talks. Um, and we're very privileged to have Dr. Abramov uh, joining us today, the Watsky Allen Professor of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Iowa. He's a neuroscientist, fellowship trained, retina specialist and computer engineer. Uh, Dr. Abramov is the founder and executive chairman of Digital Diagnostics, which is the autonomous AI diagnostics company that was the first in any field of medicine to get FDA authorization for an autonomous AI. Dr. Abramov has developed an ethical foundation for autonomous AI that was used during the design, validation and regulatory and payment pathways for autonomous AI. And as the author of over 300 peer reviewed publications in this field, he has been cited over 31,000 times and the inventor of 17 patents and many applications. Dr. Dr. Abramov has mentored dozens of engineering students, ophthalmology residents, retina fellows, and his passion is to use this AI to improve the affordability, access and quality of care. So thank you very much for, for taking the podium. Sorry, Michael, I think you might not be muted, unmuted. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. I didn't see that. Um, so thanks so much for the honor and very excited to be here. Uh, I saw almost 200 participants. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a great honor to, to do this. Um, uh, I have conflicts of interest that are listed on the bottom of my slide here. Um, also, I want to add that I'm the chair of the foundational principles of AI work group that was created by FDA and is part of the larger collaborative community on ophthalmic imaging. And so, like the introduction said, there is now several, we were the first, but there's others, uh, autonomous AIs that were approved by FDA for diabetic retinopathy. So this is real. It's not the future anymore. Uh, and in this case, you see the picture here in the center. It's a AI system created by a robotic camera, uh, an AI algorithm that makes a diagnosis, uh, operator training, um, and now it's safe for the COVID area because of various uh, measures. This makes a diagnosis at the point of care, so where the patient is, rather than a patient traveling to the ophthalmologist or eye care provider, they can do it, they have it where they have their diabetes management. It takes a few minutes, there's no human oversight, that's why it's called autonomous integrated with the EMR and automated coding and billing, which is very important in the US. It's being widely used in the US. You've probably seen names you're familiar with. So it's, you know, going as fast as we can we, to install these systems. Even in retail grocery stores, you can actually in the US go 
to a, a primary care clinic in grocery stores, in the back of grocery stores, between the carrots and the diapers, walk through and get your diabetic eye exam, um, you know, with a high safety and high efficiency. Uh, I want to stress this word autonomous AI because there's a lot of AI around and you've heard it and the previous speaker mentioned it. Autonomous AI is AI where the medical decision is made by the computer. There is no human oversight of this diagnosis. That means it's instantaneous. It takes only a few minutes for the whole process and only a few seconds for the actual algorithmic diagnosis to be made. It can be done at the point of care, mention that where the patient is, but it also means that there's legal liability for the company or other creator of the AI, the autonomous AI. That is very different on the right, assistive AI, where there's still a clinician needed to make the medical decision, but they are also liable for the clinician and the AI is more of an aid to the diagnostic process. You know, it was already mentioned, we created this ethical framework and that was really important when we wanted to show how, um, uh, how to bring autonomous AI into healthcare. Because people say, well, I have this AI algorithm. And I, in my view, AI algorithms are now a commodity. There's so many around. Uh, and it's relatively easy to make high-performing algorithms for diabetic retinopathy, but also for many other diseases. But how you actually implement it, the healthcare system is a different matter. So we had to create ethical foundations, went to FDA, we spent eight years working with FDA in clinical trial design and how to actually show that an AI is safe ultimately resulting in the approval in 2018, uh, work with the American Diabetes Association and patient organization to create clinical standards of care that include AI for the management of diabetes. Very important in the US National Committee of Quality Assurance that sets measures for quality and care and that now allows AI to be used. And then finally, uh, American Academy of Ophthalmology as well as the American Medical Association have been very supportive of implementing this but also creating so-called coding, CPT coding, as well as now reimbursement and for the first time ever, CMS, the US system for Medicare for insurance has set a rate of $55.66 as of a few weeks ago. But ultimately this is of course about improving patient outcomes and address health disparities like the previous speaker already mentioned, which is a great problem in diabetes care, but you need to do all these steps to be able to affect patient outcomes. And like I mentioned, you know, we did a great effort to do this uh, clinical trial, first ever pre-registered clinical trial for autonomous AI. And it's, it's somewhat daunting to see that it's still the only peer-reviewed publication on uh, an autonomous AI trial. 2018, I mentioned it first FDA approval. 2020, I mentioned it first autonomous AI in the standard of care uh, from the American Diabetes Association. Uh, I mentioned this, I will skip that. And then it's very exciting, only a few weeks ago, uh, for the first time ever, Medicare, the CMS, um, the payment system for uh, anyone in the US over 65, decided to cover uh, autonomous AI diagnosis for diabetic retinopathy at $55.66. And then private payers uh, actually pay more uh, in the US. So this is sort of a baseline rate, uh, the lowest rate you can get. Um, also uh, exciting that we see it now expanding in, into use for children with diabetes, of course, a big uh, problem uh, and, and even cause of blindness in young people. So together with Johns Hopkins, we have been implementing that in clinics where pediatric patients with diabetes are seen. And this is a cost effectiveness study showing cost effectiveness from the patient perspective. Um, I do not want to forget about uh, where, where you guys are all at, we, you know, in Asia. Uh, we actually have uh, a bunch of partnerships. Some have been announced with Orbis, uh, with Topcon. You see the pictures here. Uh, some are you know, still to be announced and we, we like to wait until we have actual success in implementing and affecting patient outcomes. So you can expect more of these announcements over the next uh, year or two. But we only do this through partnerships. We don't want to do that alone. So I mentioned, I, I think, you know, very exciting story that this was done, this can be done if you do it the right way. But I do want to mention, you know, uh, even the title of my talk, uh, uh, patient-centric AI. And what do I mean by that? Well, one, uh, one of my concerns is preventing a backlash for AI in healthcare. And we have two historical examples of where this went south. One is gene therapy, where in the early 2000s, there were some inappropriate uh, clinical trials of gene therapy. 
uh, young people died and there was an essentially moratorium on gene therapy uh, uh, studies. And only in 2017 did the FDA for the first time approve gene therapy for LCA, uh, Libus congenital amaurosis. Uh, so that was a delay of almost two decades that might not have been necessary. And the other one that we run into every, almost every day, we talk to healthcare systems, is Theranos, where also the expectations were high. There was a lot of unethical behavior by the company and that, you know, of course went under, but there's a lot of fear about things like this. And you can actually see that very recently, a lot of publications about inappropriate bias, uh, inappropriate data usage, usage uh, in AI, in healthcare. Uh, and so that is something that uh, patients are concerned about and they have questions and these questions are appropriate. Will it benefit me as a patient? What is happening to my data when an AI looks at my data? Is there racial and ethnic bias? Who is liable for errors that the AI makes and who pays for all of this? I have to call this Glamour AI. Glamour AI is AI that is really exciting from a technological perspective, but doesn't affect patient outcome, doesn't improve what ultimately is a patient benefit. And so looking back, there was a choice uh, we made in, in what we did in the healthcare system with AI. We could have been the Uber of healthcare where we disrupted healthcare and say, well, this is the AI, this is the technology, it works, uh, deal with it. Or the other choice is work within the healthcare system, which was our choice, hence, you know, FDA approval, all these ethical foundations, all working together with all stakeholders in healthcare, including patient organizations. But that did mean that I need to bring up uh, ethics and, you know, we won't go into great detail because I see ethics as a way of measuring uh, requirements that an AI needs to meet. Um, it's not, you know, uh, very uh, theoretical. I think it's very practical. And there's like the three ethical principles that you need to find a balance with, with any AI and any company and anyone using AI, including first do no harm or no maleficence, autonomy of the patient and justice. So many publications uh, about this recently, uh, now that we have, you know, uh, more time to talk, uh, think about this and more time to, to work on the actual implementation and what it means as an ethical framework, you can find these online. There's actually uh, a lot of uh, panels and debates that have been happening recently about ethics of autonomous AI and AI in general in healthcare. And if you're interested, you can you know find these uh, YouTube videos of me doing that. Um, I, I do want to point them out. So AI ethical requirements that we are now trying to put into best practices are improve patient outcome and show that by direct evidence or indirect evidence validate rigorously for safety, efficacy, and equity against clinical outcome within the clinical workflow, respect the autonomy of the patient by using patient data transparently, traceably, and respectfully, design AI algorithms that are maximally reducible to human clinician cognition, and assume liability for the performance. And the last is actually a requirement for the American Medical Association for AI creators. I want to give a few examples of what it actually means for diabetic retinopathy AI. For example, you can train an AI, a convolutional neural network, a deep learning network, uh, using image samples. And I'm showing that above, you take a bunch of retina images with a label. I think the previous speaker mentioned that, and you just blindly train an AI. Uh, you do not know uh, why the uh, algorithm makes the decisions it makes, and there is easy to, um, uh, to create bias within the AI. There's another way of doing this where you create detectors, machine learning detectors that detect the different lesions that we are all familiar with in diabetic retinopathy, including exudates, hemorrhages, and microaneurysms, and use these to analyze the images coming from the patient. And there you have a built-in invariance to race, ethnicity, age, etc. because what we know is that these lesions are important and not the background color of the retina. And so I could try to compare that to what we know about the human physical system. And actually that's, you know, I, I'm proud to call myself you know, still a neuroscientist, even though, you know, the last time I was in the lab has been a while now, but yeah, this is an inspiration for building these type of systems where you have multiple parallel detectors for each of the different lesions that ultimately result in a patient uh, uh, level result. And it's interesting, uh, I don't think we have time to show this, but actually this on the left is an image you know, that you all recognize has some diabetic retinopathy in it. The center is an image where that was slightly uh, changed, a few pixels. Uh, you and I don't see any difference. AI algorithms that use detectors based on lesions don't see any difference, but convolutional neural networks that are trained based on images and nothing else 
um, you know, miss 97% of cases of this, uh, of the disease in the, in the center image. And, you know, we and groups at Harvard have extensively published about that now, so I won't go into it too much. Another uh, matter is what do you compare the AI against? Because many times that is clinicians, right? The group of clinicians or a single clinician is compared to the AI. And if the AI and the clinician, the clinician disagree, it is said that the AI is wrong and the clinician is right. Well, that actually may not be true. And I'm sure it's not true. And in fact, I only do studies comparing uh, ophthalmologists like me to retina specialists, even to prognostic standards like EDTRS show a sensitivity of only 33 or 34%. So really low sensitivity, missing more than half the cases that actually matter. And so maybe it is not appropriate or the best way if we can avoid it to compare AI to clinicians and rather we should, in my view, if we can compare it to protoxic standards that have been validated over decades like EDTRS read by the Wisconsin Reading Center, we actually are creating levels of reference standards starting, like I said, from prognostic standard or patient outcome all the way to reading centers, to uh, groups of uh, standardized readers, uh, ultimately to a single reader that was never validated. And we have such a standard in diabetic retinopathy. That's in fact why the first uh, uh, you know, AI cleared by FDA wasn't diabetic retinopathy because we are all able to build on the shoulders of giants that created the EDTRS, DRC, DRS, DRCR standards that are used today for FDA drug trials and now also for AI. And you know, one problem is we cannot recreate this ethically because I'm actually involved in a work group trying to create a new standard for diabetic retinopathy. And there is a problem with natural outcomes of diabetic retinopathy. We cannot leave these patients untreated. But clinicians like you and me are not validated against this standard that had had a surprisingly low diagnostic drift over four, dec four, four decades, meaning 40 years. And just as an example, uh, I don't want to run over my time, but uh, you know, in this image on the right, there's a very standardized way of saying this is EDTRS level 43 and uh, based on OCT DRCL level without uh, di diabetic macular edema. So we can actually say that in a standardized way and we know what the patient outcome will be. I will skip this because the, the results are relevant, but I want to place them into context. So this AI, uh, like other AIs, had a really high uh, uh, performance compared to clinicians. But if you now look at the reference standard of uh, EDTRS and uh, OCT-based diabetic macroedema, you see a sensitivity of 87% and a specificity of 90%. Repeat visually is very high, of course, but if you compare it to board-certified ophthalmologists on the right and red circle against the same standard, it's, of course, you know, much more sensitive. And we recently uh, published at the Macula Society meeting uh, uh, a paper about remoting reading networks compared to the same standard, and they achieve around 70%. Um, uh, again, again, against the same standard. So this AI patient centricity, I want to come back to that uh, while, while I finish my talk. And we actually calculated what it means for a patient to have a positive or negative output from the AI. So if the IDX, the R algorithm says, is there's diabetic retinib or diabetic macular edema present, what does that mean for the outcome of the patient if left untreated? And it means that 18.5% likelihood of proliferative diabetic retinopathy in three years, again, if untreated, 17.7% likelihood of DME that needs to be treated in one year if left untreated. And if it's absent, those percentages are fairly low, as you can see here. So in other words, if a patient is left untreated and has an AI positive output, more than 10 times the risk of PDR in three years and seven times the risk of DME in one year, these are very poor outcomes. But you cannot say this if you validate your AI against clinicians because these have not been validated against the outcome. You can only do that if you compare to these reference standards. So what does patient-centric AI mean or what is it starting to mean? It shows that it can improve patient outcome. It shows rigorous validation against prognostic standards that is in the peer-reviewed literature. It uses patient data transparently, traceably, and respectfully. AI algorithms that it uses are maximally reducible to human clinician cognition. So we know what they do and we know and can show that there's no bias. And also there's an assigned liability, meaning we know who's liable for errors that the AI makes. I'm proud to say that we're you know, going ahead rapidly with the foundational principles of atomic algorithmic interpretation. And there's actually a bunch of papers coming out, uh, hopefully very soon, uh, so you can learn uh, more about the background of all of this. I want to thank you very much again for the honor of speaking to you. Um, and I hope we have a very exciting uh, question uh, session.
Well, thank you very much. That was fantastic to, to hear about all that vast amount of work and the history of um, the patient-centered autonomous AI and the new definitions of what is a gold standard um, when we're validating against specialists or what, what is the true um, correct gold standard. So I'd like to open to some of the panelists and uh, see if anyone has um, some probing questions for you. And Gavin. For Gavin also, right? I mean, it's for both. And for Gavin, absolutely, yeah. yes. Because, because I have a question for Gavin, but you know. I, I was gonna Please. ask the question first. So, so Michael, I mean, you brought up something that's very, very important in, in the way we're thinking about how we deal with, the, with diabetic retinopathies. How do we really judge an end outcome, especially in what you mentioned, it becomes unethical to not treat and wait for an adverse outcome. We can't redo what was done for the ETDR study, but that's almost 40 years ago. What are your thoughts on how we should take we should take this? Are we going to uh, develop new sorry dates that don't really, um, which is not the equivalent of, for example, developing vision loss or high risk PDR? That, that was the question. Yes. Yeah. No. I, um, we we like like you said. You know, we cannot leave patients untreated to know how their outcome can be. We can We we do know. Wyckoff had a very interesting paper in Diabetes Care a few weeks ago, actually, about this. You know, the, the, the outcome in terms of visual loss when, when people are treated uh, in, in the US, according to the IRS registry, which is the natural real world uh, evidence, really, that we're getting. And so I think you need to compare it to that baseline. That is now the new baseline. The new normal is not le letting people go blind uh, willy nilly. It, the, the new baseline is the standard, you know, the, the real world. It's not a standard of care, really, but it's what actually ha is happening to patients. And we can base it on that. And so there is a work group from the Ju Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, which I happen to be part of, where we're trying to, to use that type of, of studies and we're planning studies to look at the different aspects, diabetic macular edema, neurodegeneration, as well as the ischemic component of diabetic retinopathy. That is beyond the subject of my talk, but absolutely, we need to do more of that to be able to better evaluate treatments, diagnostic interventions, et cetera. So great question, yes. Can I uh, ask my question, uh, Gavin? <laughs> sure, sure. Yes, please. Because please. I... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Michael, please go ahead. So you, you, great talk. And I was, I, I was sort of thinking, you know, given foresight and no toll and, you know, this home OCT that we, we see, back to diabetic retinopathy, can we... In my view, hopefully we can still come out with like functional measures like you do on the iPhone, right? Without structural imaging measures, which makes it much more expensive that they need an OCT at home. So for CMV, well, we, we now have this and we, it's validated and it's probably the best way to do it. What do you think about diabetic macroedema, diabetic retinopathy in general? Can we get away with functional at home measures or do we need, in your view, maybe in the future structural measures, which again are are more costly? So I think um, we are getting there and I think we eventually will be able to get away with functional measures. Um, okay. DME may be a little bit different from AMD because the, the AMD kind of a visual drop-off tends to be a little bit more acute or the visual symptomology tends to be a bit more acute. We all know DME can very be very insidious in its progression. But we also know on good data from the DRCRNet studies is when DME is very mild or when DME has very good vision, often they may not do uh, worse if you waited for some deterioration before you, in, you, you went in and intervened. So it does kind of support that hypothesis that, that functional loss may be a good indicator. But again, with a lot of these devices, what we have found is that the uptake rate is not going to be 100% well of that. And those who uptake an even smaller proportion are going to be able to do it well. And an even smaller proportion are going to be doing, be able to persist in doing it often. So I think there are a lot of challenges we need to tackle before we can really replace that kind of uh, functional imaging with, sorry, to replace anatomical changes with functional imaging. But I, I think yeah. there will be an eventual path for that. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I hoped for. Thanks. We have more questions, maybe in the in the Q and A or. Yeah, Ming Ming also has a questions, right? Ming, raise your hand. Uh, it, yes, I, so actually, I, I, I really, so thank you very much for the great, uh, wonderful presentation, Michael. I, I have been 
in several or I'm, I'm your uh, super fans. <laughs> I've been on a couple of your online uh, webinar before. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, but, uh, yeah, so, but can I ask you some business secret? I understand IDS has been deployed and now you have a CMS uh, uh, reimbursement, like $50.66, which is amazing. So can I ask who is your uh, subs subscriber, but like who subscribe your service, like optometrists or ophthalmologists or diabetic uh, endocrinologists, who are the really the real user of the IDS uh, product? Thank you. So great question. It's very much for, for endocrinologists, uh, you know, primary care providers, which is where the patient is, where they get their diabetes management, right? Where they get the prescription for you know, metformin or whatever it is, where they uh, get their vital stake and their blood pressure. Uh, the doctor tells them to, you know, stop smoking and not and eat more vegetables, right? And also do something about the metabolic control. That's where the patient is. That's where the diabetic eye exam is now happening. Like in that grocery store I mentioned, there's in the state of Delaware in the US, there's now many grocery stores where you have these diabetes management clinics in the back and patients come in, go to the vitals, blood pressure, uh, A1C test, and get a diabetic eye exam. And so it's not at all for ophthalmology and optometry. We, you know, hopefully we never need to have these in our clinics. That's not, then, then you're not adding because the patient still needs to travel. There's still the COVID risk. There's still all the hassle and the weight. Um, you don't move the needle. It needs to be where the patient is. Yes, but, but in my understanding, uh, IDS is attached to TopCon Funders Camera. A specific uh, model of top funders camera. So how can how would you plan? I mean, if in the futures, how are you able to like make all this process fully automatic? I mean, just improve the automation of the whole process because uh, for a pharmacist, I mean, it's quite hard to <laughs> manipulate this funders camera, for example. Okay, so so there's two aspects. Uh, in the U.S., I, I'm speaking outside of the U.S. now, so I can. In the U.S., everything I say is regulated by FDA, and you have to be very careful. And I cannot say things that are not proven by evidence and they allow me to say. Outside the US, for example, in Europe and now in Asia, many different cameras are being used on the same IDXDR algorithm, if that makes sense. So it, it is not required to have a certain camera. However, there is a reason why the FDA required it to be at first with a specific camera. We needed to show that in the hands of a high school graduate, meaning an untrained operator, we could have a more than 80% diagnosability meaning uh, a valid diagnostic result on again with a high school graduate in a real world clinic uh, we needed to achieve that and the, what, what when we compared all the cameras out there we found that this nw400 is almost fully automated and that they were able to do it we literally had high school students come in uh, you know no training sit in front get them a patient and they were able and managed to able, uh, you know, 96% of patients. And then we showed it in the clinical trial. That is the reason we talk about the NW400, because in the US, it is approved as a system that includes the operator training, actually. Um, you know, even the manual, um, uh, there's an assistive AI that helps the operator. Oh, you need to now click here, or now you need to redo this image because the image quality is insufficient. That's very important even in a telemedicine situation that you can say, well, this patient is insufficient. This image is insufficient quality needs to be retaken because otherwise you need to recall the patient when they already left the clinic. So there's a lot of aspects around it that make it sound, you know, well, why, why this camera? Well, this was because it's a whole system. Thank you, Michael. Um, we, uh, Kevin, uh, I have a question, and then um, and then our audience also have a questions to you. So uh, we concern also about cost, about this uh, home monitoring, because I believe that um, uh, behind the AI, you really need a very uh, um, behind the tele ophthalmology or not not bring in AI is needs very expensive infrastructure. So how do you uh, like? Um, balance about the cost. And then um, I also have a question to you that uh, because um, now uh, patients is uh, not seeing the doctors that frequent. But uh, on the other hand, actually, a lot of patients, they do want to see doctors. So they complain that uh, there's a less person interaction. So how, how does this system manage this kind of uh, patients? So, so yeah, so with cost is a complicated question. 
I think the the information technology and connect, connectivity infrastructure we have worldwide in most developed and even developing countries uh, has come down. So in terms of connectivity, it's not as difficult or expensive as it used to be. Um, the cost of imaging devices have come down. So that, that, that whole cost of performing a kind of tele-interaction really is down. I mean, everybody, this is on Zoom right now, right? You can do a, a web consult on Zoom. So we feel that that cost has really come down. When it comes to home monitoring, that's a, 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 it's quite a bit more complicated a discussion, um, except that in reality, the, the cost of developing a home monitoring device really will end up in a large part uh, related to proving that this device can work reliably in a good, well-designed clinical trial. Um, we don't think the, the actual cost of running, for example, a home monitoring device without having expensive imaging, like, like Michael mentioned, is probably going to be low. Um, and then it really will end up in what the payer is willing to subvent for it, I feel. And that will, at the end of the day, drive the uptake because a company can come up with something proprietary, maybe want to charge 300 US dollars a pop for it. Nobody's going to sign up, correct? But if, the, if they have good data that you can replace a clinic visit, provide cost-effective care, then there will be a metric that, that maybe public health insurers would decide is a value add and they may decide that that's worth uh, paying for. So, so that's going to be driven by, I feel, that kind, that kind of data that, that proves that's, that's possible. Yeah. May, may I ask um, Michael or Gavin, you know, a question on the um, Q&A relates to um, the portable fundus cameras because there are cheaper cameras around, um, but it doesn't seem to have been um, a strong um, validation of, of the algorithms or how do you find the autonomous AI working in that world because it actually relies on a photographer um, with a handheld camera? Gavin, you want to take it? I can take it. We probably have the same answer. Yeah, go, go ahead, Michael. And so... We, everyone wants this, right? Everyone ideally wants an iPhone camera. <laughs> and, but that's just tricky because of the optics of the eye. But yeah, definitely, uh, there's absolutely a need for handheld and lower cost cameras. Uh, it's again, finding a balance between what works in the hands of relatively unexperienced operators. I mean, you, you and I, we are ophthalmologists. Um, and, and so we know how to operate these cameras really well. Because, you know, there's an extra multiple degrees of freedom because you're, you know, it's not on a, on a mount. So we can do it just like we do indirect ophthalmoscopy, but that is not where these are being used. So um, we, we, we compared them, you know, four years ago and, and just couldn't get it to work in, in, you know, where we had sufficient diagnosability, meaning more than 80%. Uh, I, get it, I think we're getting close right now. So there may be some announcements soon where, where you will see a, a shift there, but everyone recognizes this need, but it does need to work in the real world setting, meaning high, you know, low level, relatively low level operators. Otherwise, you just drive, drive up the cost. You know, you have a cheap camera, but you have an expensive operator. Well, you know, it, it, the best thing is a low cost uh, operator with a low cost camera. Yes. Thank you. Angus, can I have one question? Sure. Okay. Uh, congratulations, Mike and Gavin, for wonderful presentation and wonderful work. Uh, I've just query um, uh, for the regarding FDA approval of this uh, diabetic retinopathy screening is a great news for all of us in the world. So is there any definite rule? Uh, how many fundus pictures should be there for AI grading? Like two pictures is enough, one picture is enough, or many pictures? Number one question is that. And other question is, um, how do you grade diabetic macular edema in uh, digital fundus photographs, is there any definite rule or do you follow any um, any of the uh, clinical classifications or ETDRS classification? So how do you grade DME in digital fundus photographs? So, so uh, great questions. Gavin, you want me to take it or? Yeah, yeah, why don't you then? Okay, and so um, there, there's no requirement for a certain number of Fundus images, you're essentially taking a sample of the entire retina, right? Any 40 degree or even 60 degree field of view is still a small, relatively small area of the retina, of the total retina. And so uh, you can do it with one, you can do it with two, you can do it with three, 
there's a balance between the more flashes you do for a patient, the more patient friendly it becomes and the less likely they are to actually get it. No one wants the seven field stereo with 28 images per, per patient. That is, I don't know whether you ever underwent it, it's horrible. And so the, the fewer images, the more patient friendly, but the fewer image, the less area of the retina you sample for determining whether there's lesions present. And so every, every uh, company that I see is finding a balance between these two. And some use one image per eye, some use two like we did, some use three, but there's no requirement as long as you have a high safety efficiency, right? I mean, if you compare it now to, this, to the standard like EDTRS and it performs really well with one image, well, then we're good. We didn't take that risk, we decided to. And so again, there's a balance between patient friendliness and performance of the AI system as a whole in detecting disease. And then the second is, you know, diabetic macroedema. We thought it was really important. So we decided to go for the standard for diabetic macroedema, which is center involved diabetic macroedema from OCT, right? From macular OCT, which is now what we treat all patients with DME from. No one is looking at clinically significant macular edema anymore and, and looking through the bio microscope that at least that's not what I'm teaching our fellows and residents. I said, look at the OCT and look for center of macular edema, and that's what we treat. And so we use that as a standard for macular edema in the clinical trial to compare the AI against. Even though it doesn't use stereo, it doesn't use OCT, it performs surprisingly well against um, uh, OCT only diabetic macular edema. In fact, it, it found more than 80% of that. And that is probably because it finds very small exudates that humans you know just ignore uh, otherwise maybe some color changes uh, it's not clear but it did really really well and we're actually studying that in children right now because you know you have the additional complexity of the reflective ilm in young children and and, and it's sort of an interesting question but no uh, the output doesn't say whether you know what level of disease it is what whether it's macular edema or not it just says this needs to be seen by an ophthalmologist, by an eye care provider. That is the level you need to go see an eye care provider because treatment may be needed. That is what is relevant to the patient, what is relevant to where the patient is managed, which is in primary care, right? This is not for ophthalmology. This is not for you and me. This is for primary care to get the patient to where they need to be. Sorry, long answer to a short question. Hi, Mike. I, I have another Thank question uh, before Mink, uh, uh, because Mink also raised his hand. So uh, I am, this is not a scientific question. So I'm very amazed that you actually uh, brought in all the stakeholders uh, in this discussion, particularly the ethical issues. So uh, how did you drive this discussion? Um, so to gather all the stakeholders together. So any experience that you can share with us that to drive this, uh, uh, this whole work uh, move forward? To well, thank you. All the so, stakeholders. You know, you know, it's good and bad to be the first. It's mostly bad because this was an all not done. So, if you now go to the FDA and say, "I have this cool AI," and you know, I, I want to, uh, you know, show it's safe, they, they will be okay because they've already done it. When we came in in 2010, they said, "What? You want a computer to make a diagnosis? Ho ho!" And so, it's sort of. You know, we worked together uh, from a common basis where we worked on these these ethical principles that are, are pretty obvious when you think about it, but it, it, you still need to work it out. And what is everyone comfortable with? That's just the FDA. Um, and then by trial and error, uh, we started seeing, well, we now have FDA approval, but no one is paying for this. How do you do that? Well, now you better convince patient organizations and payers uh, in the US, um, you know, government institutions, um, Physicians, uh, you know, I'm the retinator, right? I mean, I, I skipped the, the, the slide, but my nickname is the retinator given to me by the chair of ophthalmology at Hopkins in 2010, so a long time ago, uh, because of my research in AI. And so there was pushback from our colleagues. And now that's over. Now they say, hey, you, you guys are doing AI the right way, which is great. But um, all of this takes time and effort, but that's done. So none of you has to do this much effort again, which is good. I mean, it's just... That's why my hair is colored the way it is. It's, you know, I went through that. And so I think it's easier now, but still it, it just makes everyone more comfortable if we realize that, you know, if you, if you make this about selling data, you know, patients are not comfortable and, and maybe some governments are not comfortable. So 
I, I think there's it's sort of guidelines or guardrails for for how to do this. But you know, if if you're thinking about doing this, we can talk separately. I don't think you know there's 200 people here. You know, I'm I'm sure they're not all interested in all aspects, but. Uh, well, anyway, it's, uh, we it's been a fantastic broad ranging discussion and uh, some Asian influence and some stories from uh, another side of the world. So thank you very much to the two speakers tonight for your great insights and experience. And um, I hope that people who've signed in tonight have learned a lot. Um, we would look forward to seeing you at the next uh, video conference uh, for this Aptos and APOIS. Um, thank you again for this evening and to Carol for co-chairing. Good night to everyone. Good night. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye bye, panelists. Thank you. Bye.